and welcome to Rare Book Cafe Coffee Break. This is our new format and this is our first segment of the new format and I'm delighted to welcome back to Rare Book Cafe my co-host Ed Markowitz um, of Montgomery Rare Books in Portland but as Ed will probably tell you at some point that's not exactly what he's going to be doing in the future. We also know, and some of you who followed Ed on Facebook know that he has been a world traveler for the last couple of years, and he's going to share some of that with us today as well. Um, I, tell us what you've been doing, Ed, and I think today we're going to talk about a couple of his uh, adventures, but in future segments we'll be hearing a lot more about what he's been doing and what he's going to be doing, which is very exciting for us. And for me, I hope. <laughs> Hi, Lee. How are you? I'm and doing you, well. Good. And, and you've been busy getting back to normal. I see you were at a book fair recently and uh, uh, post-pandemic uh, book routines have returned. Uh, to an extent. I uh, did a couple of shows last year. I'll do a couple of shows this year. But sales have been okay. So, you know, Great. We, we get by. Good. Well, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be traveling for the last four months. I left in in uh, early December and returned in late March from a, <clears throat> uh, a trip in uh, Italy, uh, Egypt, uh, Spain, and uh, Portugal. Uh, I can't even tell you what the highlight of my trip was because every day was a highlight. But probably towards the end of the trip, I decided to hike the Camino de Santiago, uh, 33 days, 490 miles, 790 kilometers from the southwest corner of Spain to the northwest, I'm sorry, the southwest corner of France, Pied de, uh, Pont de Saint-Pied, and all the way to the northwest corner of Spain um, in the, uh, Santiago de Compostela. The route began in the uh, early Middle Ages as a pilgrimage route uh, from northern and northeastern Europe to Santiago, Spain, which um, historically has been ascribed as the burial place of uh, St. James the Greater or St. James the Apostle, who actually died in the Holy Land and then they uh, allegedly moved his, his body to this point in Spain where he had once preached. Um, every year, uh, several, about 120 to 130,000 people um, make this hike. Uh, I started on February 2nd, and there weren't that many there, let me tell you. But it was wonderful. For 33 days, I had no rain. I had two days of snow, uh, which were a little bit hairy. But the weather was cold and, and clear. Um, along the way are uh, hostels called albergues. Albergues are uh, places for anywhere from a donation to 10 or 12 euros a night. You stay in a dormitory with other travelers and part of the reason why I did this was um, uh, just to have an opportunity to, to anthropological to, to meet other people from around the world and I had hiking partners from all over Europe and Asia and Korea uh, Switzerland Spain Italy America and even a couple from South America so it fulfilled all of those expectations while I was hiking, uh, you have a lot of free time in your head, and I began uh, to um, uh, clarify uh, my life goals. Well, here I am at 68, and hopefully I have a little more life ahead of me. And uh, one word, or maybe it's a hyphenated word, I'm not sure, kept coming through my thoughts, and that is book ecosystem. Several years ago, we had a guest on the Rare Book Cafe, who used the term book ecosystem, and I began to think about all the different um, aspects of the book world and, and how many of them interest me and, and how many of them were enjoyable. So for the last several years, I've had the hobby of uh, book repair and book binding, mostly for books in my own inventory, and I have decided to get out of the book selling business and become a book binder. Uh, during my travels, I found a bookbinder in Verona, Italy, who agreed to take me on as an apprentice. So at 68, I'm going to become an apprentice uh, and an apprentice bookbinder, and then hopefully return to the United States 
and uh, provide my services to the many individuals and, and many booksellers who uh, need this service. And we, there's really a dearth of book repair people around the United States. So I've decided to sell most of my inventory and over the next six months, much of my book inventory will be on uh, auction at Pacific Book Auctions and uh, move to Verona, Italy, the city of love, the home of Romeo and Juliet. So that's what I'm up to, Lee. Well, that sounds exciting. Uh, share with us some of the things that you have actually already done, but we're going to look forward to a lot of reports from Verona when you get there. Yeah. I know you've been to the Library at Alexandria. I have been, but you know, think about that. In, in, in four months, five months from now, you and I are going to be doing this Rare Book Cafe from two different parts, two different hemispheres, two different parts of the world. Boy, right. te technology sure has changed things. <laughs> yes, yes. we tried to keep it working. <laughs> yes, I had the uh, great opportunity uh, to go to Egypt, uh, travel up and down the Nile, visit some, uh, visit Luxor and the temples at Karnak, and of course, the, of course the, the Great Pyramids of Giza and other places. But additionally, I visited the uh, Library of Alexandria. And as you know, we've had a returning guest on here, Sharif Afifi, right. who is the uh, head of restoration at the library. Unfortunately, I didn't get to meet with Sharif personally. I was in Alexandria on a Friday and Saturday. Friday was his day of prayer. Saturday was his day off, and he already had some family obligations. So we didn't meet personally, but he did set up a wonderful tour for me. Um, this first photo you see is the outdoor uh, uh, front of the library. It looks a, uh, like a sail, like the sail of a boat or the sail of a dahabia. Dahabia, um, D-A-H-A-B-I-Y-A, are the sailboats that you'll see traveling up and down the Nile River. Uh, there's so much in the architecture of this magnificent library that is um, uh, describable. Uh, first of all, the Library of Alexandria, once the greatest library in the world, was started in three, uh, the third century BCE by Ptolemy. Ptolemy had been uh, put in place by Alexander the Great to run the country of Egypt, which he had conquered. And uh, Ptolemy built the uh, original um, library, which is said to have kept up to 700,000 scrolls and um, ancient manuscripts. Somewhere towards the end of that century, however, there was a great fire and unfortunately much of that was destroyed. In 2002, the new library of Alexandria was uh, reopened and uh, rededicated. And as you can see from this photo, uh, that is the front of the library. The representation of the sale is also inscribed with hieroglyphics and calligraphy from all of the languages around the world to represent the, the housing of, of languages in the library. I think we have another uh, that, picture. That, that, is a, that is amazing. My, uh, my eight-year-old grandson's um, gifted class did a se uh, segment on hieroglyphics around Valentine's mm. and managed, <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting, managed to come up with hieroglyphics to uh, to write little notes to people for Valentine's Day. Oh, kind of like a rebus. Which, uh, kind of, yeah, it was more like a rebus than anything else, but it was really interesting. And he was just fascinated with the whole idea of this being another way to write things you know yeah. just really really like that a lot uh but i think the idea that so many languages are included on there gives you a sense of how important the library of alexandria is to the whole world you know not just to egypt yeah. and and i know how much we enjoyed the sessions that we had with sharif you know a couple of years ago right and uh, and his work there um yeah. uh, so i'm sorry you didn't get to meet with him he, no, he but uh, give me a reason to go back. 
<laughs> yeah, right. That's true. That's true. Maybe we could have a big field trip. The Rare Book Cafe could. We could all go or something. That sounds good. That, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. I see there's another picture up on the screen right now. This is a carpet that uh, hung in front of, uh, excuse me if I get this wrong, but I think it's called the Carbola. The Carbola is the large black granite uh, block that's in the middle of the holy city of Medina that uh, Muslims make a pilgrimage to Medina. Is it Medina or Mecca? Hmm. Uh... I'm gonna I have think to double. I think the pilgrimage is to Mecca, but Mecca. I'm okay, yeah. So the the large black sure. granite of uh, Mecca is, is um, encased by these carpets, and the um, the leader of, uh, uh, of Saudi Arabia uh, bequeathed one of these gold threaded carpets to the museum. Awesome, huh? Had it been hanging outside? Yeah. Oh, Could you imagine the it's brilliance, <laughs> brilliance in the morning wow. sun? And, and, and this oh, is only wow. one side. There was one on all four sides of the cube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is it is amazing. It is it is just it uh, the whole uh, the whole field of various art forms is just so fascinating that people's minds and hands can produce things like this. Just. It's, yeah, and the uh, close association between art and books. Right, right, yes. And your association with art and books is going to become even closer. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I think we have another we, photo here. We may here. find you... Oh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was I going said, to we say, may find you doing, doing your own books, uh, like when, when we've had you know, people on the show who have done, who, who specialize in book art. You know, we may find we may find you doing your own books at some point. Well, we'll see. I'm going to have it's a long way for me to get there. I'm not very it's artistic, and yeah. I admit to that. I'm probably looking more at restoration uh, re and repair. But uh, if I get talented enough someday, maybe I will do <laughs> okay. something a little okay. bit more creative. So the uh, the contract for the uh, Library of Alexandria, as you can imagine, a, a world renowned piece of architecture uh, was a, a grand uh, lottery and um, it was um, finally built and dedicated in 2002 and this is the great reading room you can see in the reading room and, and it's hard to uh, perceive from this photo but none of that uh, light that you see coming in from the roof is actually coming in from the roof it's all indirect lighting so that the sunlight doesn't fade and destroy any of the books. Um, so, how accessible is the library? Oh, very, very. I mean, they've got I, I mean, they've got uh, public tours at ten thirty every day, and there's people from all over the world. And of course, the the guides are were magnificent. There's also a museum inside that houses some of the libraries of. Of the, of, the, of the great Egyptian authors and writers and philanthropists. Um, it, it's very accessible. Just show your, your passport and get your badge and, and wander around like most any library. If you want something pulled off the wow. shelf, you, you hand it to the library and she goes into the stacks and gets it for you. Wow. Uh, yeah. Does anybody tell you to be quiet? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I probably would if you were noisy, but you know, people have have such reverence for the place, and and and, uh, right. and and it's designed such that it's really not that noisy. I mean, even though, though there are tour groups wandering around the library, uh, uh, it's it's not that you can sit there and read a book or unscroll <laughs> a. a un unscroll, unscroll a scroll. Man, unscroll a scroll. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, last year, 2022, was the 20th anniversary of the, the library. Here you can see on some steps of the entrance um, a, a small pyramid, uh, the, the crescent moon, uh, which is a symbol of, um, of Islam, and um, the statue, which I honestly can't remember what it represents, but it seems to be a very universal statue of of man, mankind. Okay. 
Bibliotheca Alexandria. Well, that is that is fascinating, and and it's so nice to have a, a reference with the pictures. Going back to our when we had Sharif on the show, uh, you know, we saw his workshop and mm -hmm. what he was doing there. But it's good to have this kind of reference, you know, for the overall picture, uh, uh, you know, of, of of where it is that he works. Yeah. This is, this is interesting. This photo of the printing press was actually the first printing press brought to Egypt. And it wasn't until the uh, early 1800s. So you imagine a country like Egypt who My has goodness. had the, um, the legacy of writing, the legacy of scrolls and uh, manuscripts for, for thousands, 5,000, 7,000, 5 to 7,000 years. And they never actually had a printing press until the early 1800s. And this is it right there on the floor of the library. That is really uh, rather hard to believe that, you know, prior to that, everything was done by hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, 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 that is, that's, you know, we're so used to thinking about printing starting in the 1400s. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that 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 really is a kind of an eye opener. Almost to, four. Uh, it wasn't until that. 400 years later right. that the country of Egypt got its first printing press. Wow, wow. Well, I know you also want to question why the United States does not have book kiosks in every town and city, uh, uh, because you have been exposed to so many wonderful opportunities to buy books in, in your travels. Uh, Dick, tell us a little bit about what you have seen and, um, uh, you know, how different it is from book shops here in our country. Yeah, well, um, first of all, let me say that uh, everywhere I traveled, I would always visit bookstores, bookshops, uh, whether well, they were antiquarian bookshops or, or modern retail bookshops. And, uh, you know, the countries of Italy and Spain uh, have... Uh, uh, such tremendous uh, antiquarian book stores and map stores. I was in seventh heaven visiting those. Um, anybody who's ever been to Paris and strolled down the Seine can't help but notice the outdoor book kiosks. They're usually painted green, sometimes green with flowers or green with murals on the side, and they seem quite quaint and enjoyable. And then when I was traveling in Rome, I also noticed uh, outdoor book kiosks uh, along the Tiber. And I began to wonder, why does Europe have such a heritage of outdoor book selling while well, we here in the United States have virtually uh, nothing to represent that? Well, it turns out that um, outdoor book selling began as early as the uh, 16th century. So in the early 1500s, uh, or mid to late 1500s, book dealers in France were setting up kiosks along the Seine. And there was actually a point, uh, at one point in time, France had thousands of outdoor book stalls. Eventually, in the late 1800s, they decided to clean the city up a little bit. And today there are 230 licensed, registered, permitted bookstalls along the Seine in France. I'd say there's probably um, 30 or 40 along the Tiber in Rome. Uh, Lee, why has and, this never and, caught on in the U.S.? I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we would be hard-pressed to come up with 230 independent bookstores that are indoors, <laughs> you know, much less outdoors. Uh, you know, our independent bookstores are just disappearing daily it seems like and uh and to have that kind of uh it just it, it I, I don't know why we don't have them i, I don't but we have great uh, locations i mean you think of venice beach in yeah. southern california and oh yeah it's, it's warm yeah. and it's dry and it's a great environment for books uh, yeah you, you think of uh, some of the uh, great rivers in america uh that 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 have other types of um uh, bucanistas, and in, in France they're called the bucanistas, that have other types of uh, uh, crafty uh, kiosks. Right, right. I, so I, began, I don't know. 
thinking about that, and, and you know, maybe because America is a more modern country, and, and now that we're becoming a more technical country, uh, a technically um, developed country, um, one thing that came to my mind are um, book vending machines. Maybe we could start a culture in this country of book vending machines. What do you think about that? Kind of like the automat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of a piece of pie, you could get a book. <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's a clever idea. Um, but I, another reason I think that uh, that we don't walk. Hmm. Uh, you know, we, we, we just, we, if we can't get in the car and go there, we tend yeah. You know, we walk right. when we vacation and we walk, say, in Paris, you know, sure. we would walk. But but we don't walk like I go to if I go to Atlanta, I don't go to Atlanta and walk. Right. But Atlanta would be a great place to, you know, to find book kiosks downtown. Yeah. Yeah. And these kiosks, not only do they sell uh, books, but mostly used books, but they sell newspapers and magazines and the, the, the entire ecosystem of books, so to speak. Right, and I would imagine maps of the city and, yeah. uh, you know, other tourist-related materials, you know, would be a good thing. Right. Well, that's a, well, an interesting... One more and, point I want to make is I began to think about why America doesn't have book kiosks and the potential for book vending machines. Think about this, Lee. As you know, there's a great deal of a discussion in America right now about... Um, book banning in schools and many legislators oh, yes. are beginning to take a book banning and some legislatures are even defunding libraries I, I know I know so here's uh, what we do the, we invest in vending machines and we put them in school libraries with the banned books in the vending machine and that way if a child comes to school with a note from his parent that he's allowed to check out this book, they just pop it out of the vending machine. Sounds like a good idea to me. Or, uh, I know. It, go ahead. When, when we were in Florida at the book fair, you know, several people were talking about, uh, who were teachers, you know, were talking about the lists that they're getting, you know, saying you can't teach this, you can't talk about this, you know, you, this kind of thing. We're not having, I mean, we have some people screaming and yelling about books here, but it's not such an issue in the schools yet, uh, at least not locally. Good. Uh, but in the places where it is an issue, what I'd also recommend is we put, take some of these book vending machines and we set them up right outside the school. If we want to stick a thumb in the eye of some of these draconian uh, legislators, we put the vending machine with the banned books right outside of the school limits yeah. and let the children or the parents access the books as they choose. Right, and not on school property necessarily, yeah. so you can't complain about that. Maybe we should put them outside the legislature, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So they that, can see that, the uh, books that, that they're actually banning so they and realize that they're read, probably the books read they read the when books. they were a child. And, and they can actually read the books that they are, are yeah. trying to ban. Yeah. Because I don't think they do. Lee, between I you and I, I think we're going to get this problem solved. That's right. That's right. If we could just find somebody to build the... Well, you've got a technology background. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Could, could you build a vending machine? <laughs> um, well... You know, at this stage in my life and wanting to be part of the book um, ecosystem, if I were to do anything, I'd get a bookmobile. And that allowed me to travel <laughs> well, across yeah. America yeah. in my bookmobile and, and visit all the high points of America that would be fun. and sell some. Wouldn't that be fun? That would be fun. Yeah. Well, I have just built a little book library, a, a little lending library. Uh -huh. Our art center here has a spring what's called a basket auction, but the idea it can be any kind of container with anything in it. And the Ridge Books has always done something book related for the auctions. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted to do a little lending library right. that could go in the yard or a porch or a classroom. And um, rather than have somebody build me a cabinet, an idea I found online was to use a small refrigerator, a dorm-sized refrigerator. Mm. And a friend of mine had one available. 
Mm -hmm. So I got it. I stripped all the mechanical stuff off, mm -hmm. spray painted it turquoise, <laughs> and uh, have stocked it with uh, both children and adults books, a few puzzles, some magazines, and it's going to be at silent auction starting next week. And I, I'm going to do a segment on, I, I have documented the entire thing from the really nasty uh, piece of equipment that I've got to the finished product. And so I'm cool. going to do a segment on that at some point and we'll see how that goes. But those are popping up around. Yeah, I was, I was surprised along the Camino de Santiago. Almost every little town that I wandered through had a, had a lending library. And uh, yeah. they're very popular in Spain. Unfortunately, I don't read Spanish, so there wasn't much that I could grab out. <laughs> it didn't do much good, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see how this goes. Um, our friend Tom Dorn of Tom Dorn Books in Atlanta mm -hmm. has one in his yard. Uh, oh. But what people say is that they have, it, people will take the books, but the leave a book concept does not catch on as quickly. <laughs> so they're glad, glad to take them, but I'm, I'm thinking I need to put together a box of of extras to go with my refrigerator. Yeah, just send so an email out to your, your your peers in the area, and I'm sure everybody can ship oh, you oh, a box. Oh yeah, it of won't it won't be. It um, won't take long. It, it, but, I, but I'm, I'm pleased with the way that it's turned out. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, this Super. has been uh, it's been great to have you back. To have I'm you back in the country, back. even for a brief period of time. Well, and, I, I'm, um, my, I plan oh, on leaving in September, so I'll be around for four about four or okay. five months. Okay, good, good. Um, and I want to remind everyone that this is a new format of shorter programs, usually with one guest, and, but you need to subscribe either on Facebook or YouTube so that you'll be sure to get notifications of all our upcoming programs. And we do have some things that will be coming fairly soon. Gigi Best of the Best Richardson African Diaspora Literary and Cultural Museum Woo, that's always you do that time. much better than I that. ever did. Well, I've practiced a lot, <laughs> and we and and we've already recorded Gigi, so I had to had to get it right. Uh, uh, they're in St. Augustine now, and she is going to be um, she'll be up she'll be coming up on the program fairly recently, fairly soon. Mm -hmm. We also have a report on the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair with Sarah Smith, who's the fair good, manager good. from Lighthouse Books, excellent uh, in Dade City, Florida. Uh, Larry Raycal will be joining us again. With children's, children's books. Books. Always good to have yes, Larry. Yes. He has it some is. of the and some of the most obscure and interesting stories. Collection. Great anecdotes. He does. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Richard Morey, uh, our road warrior, will be joining us uh, as he is on the road. He was in Florida as well, and um, and like I said, I'll be doing a segment of my little library at some point too. And, and if well, that's people great that, that you've got uh, the next couple of weeks lined up, but I would certainly like to encourage we, people to send us some, some suggestions of who they'd like to see on the show. Right, right. Um, and, Is and Mary we'll Kay going to be back? I certainly hope so. We haven't heard, um, haven't heard anything from her recently. Uh, she's been in Orlando. Uh, Dennis has been working for Universal down there. Okay. And she's been doing a lot of her art and... And but I don't know how Hamlet's coming along, you know, in her Tangle Shakespeare. So we're certainly hoping to have Mary Kay on as well, and certainly welcome su suggestions from our listeners and viewers, and um, and we'll be glad to get in touch with them and let them come on and be with us. So uh, super uh, duper. But we're glad to be back. Glad to be back. We appreciate everyone joining us today, and look forward to uh, your comments and your participation in the future. One last we'll thank you to T. Allen yes. Smith, the producer and director yes. of the show, who brought us all back. Thank you, oh, Alan. Goodness. And we have to, and we have we have sponsors. Uh, uh, we are sponsored by the Florida Antiquarian Booksellers Association and by Biblio, and uh, could not do it without their help as well. So this is going to be uh, exciting. It's a big a big enterprise these days. So we'll look forward <laughs> to our next one. Uh, All right. And goodbye for, every, for now, everyone.